Good evening, everybody. When Andy speaks about from around the globe, I've travelled from Cambridgeshire. <laughs> I don't want you to be under any misapprehensions. I'm delighted to be here this evening. I plan to speak for around 20 to 25 minutes, and then should be 10 minutes for questions, as Andy has suggested. You have that, I think, in front of you. I'm not going to dwell. Matty Woods. Uh, is a business that uh, we believe has some fairly simple aims and objectives and a, a fairly straightforward uh, reason for existing. And one of the things I'd like to talk about this evening is going to be how we do that. I'd like to talk a little bit about organic growth, hats, horses and acquisitions. If I haven't crossed all of those off by the time we finish, you need to let me know. We do, as Andy uh, said, have clients at the heart of what we do. We also recognise that being in the wealth management financial services space, uh, it's pretty crowded and there are plenty of other people that, that do a very good job. We believe, really wholeheartedly, that to deliver what we're best at alongside what other people are best at is the right way of doing things. And so, as you'll hear me say probably a couple of times, we do act as trusted advisor and provider something the FCA are talking a lot about uh, in the form of vertical integration. We are a business that was established uh, by Ian Mattioli and Bob Woods. Uh, famously, they would tell you, in a garage around about 26 years ago. Uh, Ian uh, is very proud uh, about the fact that the first telephone system they bought for themselves uh, worked sufficiently for the size of the business for more than 10 years. I think you do well to buy a telephone system that works for 10 years at all these days, so that, that is something to say. And the business has grown through a combination of organic and acquisitive growth. Uh, the business started out when uh, Ian and Bob recognised in their former employment that there was a gap in the market for really brilliant pension service and administration, just at the nascence of the SIP market, as many of you will probably recall. Providing brilliant pension service and administration was not a given, and they had a second plan on their original business plan, which they still have, <clears throat> and that was to really turn this into a lifestyle business, to get it to a point where they and their, at the time, young families could benefit from running a successful, profitable business, and frankly, they had no intention of doing most of the things that are on this slide. We now have just over 600 staff, in nine stroke ten locations, depending how you count our office in Edinburgh, which I'll talk more about later. We take care of not much shy of eight billion pounds worth of assets. Uh, the business was uh, listed on AIM uh, around about 11 years ago, uh, actually probably nearer 12 years ago, and we are continuing to grow, as, as Andy has said. The business moved, as clients required it to, from being a pensions administrator and service provider uh, and a direct SIP provider to also providing wealth management. It was perhaps natural that when clients came to us to put their business premises, their factory, their investments into a SIP, they would also say, is there anything you can do for me for my pet, ISA, etc. And so we started growing the business out into wealth management and indeed our letterhead went from being talking about pensions to pensions and wealth management. Uh, through a couple of acquisitions, one of which was, was my own business, we uh, added on, through what we call gap fill, employee benefits. And as you'll hear later on, although this is a modest part of our business, it's a really essential part of our business and something that brings a great deal of uh, opportunity, uh, certainly as, as we look at uh, what we think might be coming around the corner. And out of all of that, we started to do a little more of the advisor and provider so we were always provider in the sense that we provided a Mattioli Woods SIP, we were, we were doing that, and we were advisor, but we recognised there were other areas that we could, we could move into. We love doing business tomorrow with people that we don't know today. And although that's a, a new phrase for us, it's, it's actually when you look back at business something that has always happened. Uh, and again, I'd, I'd like to talk about how we do that and, and how we grow. We have just uh, been on our 
uh, annual results roadshow. So I have incorporated some of the figures that, that have not long been out, been out over the last couple of weeks. But I didn't want this to be a repeat of the annual report, so hopefully uh, you'll allow me to, to mix these, these things. Talking about our model and also where we've been over the last year, and as Andy said, I'll talk a little bit more about the future. Uh, we have on the right-hand side of this slide a client, quite intentionally, right at the heart of, of what we do, providing administration, providing asset management, providing other services, being the advisor, providing a platform for investments. We are seen as a trusted advisor and a manager and increasingly as a provider. This is not done by accident. Uh, this may be a little unkind to some, however I can see looking around the room that many of you will be investors in companies that have done what I'm about to talk about. We talk about think, plan and execute and yet we often see people only doing one of those things. Great ideas but then not putting a plan in place therefore it never comes up planning to do something but never executing it, and worst of all, those people that execute and ask questions afterwards. Uh, we, we really put a lot of store by what we think we're going to be able to do over the future of the business. Uh, I'm involved with a charity, Alzheimer's Research UK, uh, and one of their phrases is that research is the future. Well, for us, we, we can't live on the medals and the gongs and the awards that we've won over the years. We can't live off this year's results. We're really interested in growing the business and taking it on. And building a, a scalable and sustainable business is, is an important part of that. I have a couple of people in my own office who, in the dim and distant past, worked for employers who didn't pay them every month. Now, hopefully that doesn't happen very often these days, but it's a nice thing to remind the youngster when they join us on an apprenticeship or via a graduate trainee program that this is a business that has much more than its regulatory requirements from a capital perspective that actually has that interest in all of our stakeholders. Yes, the shareholder, yes, the client, yes, the suppliers, and yes, the staff. Uh, we're very proud that our organic growth uh, in the last year exceeded our uh, growth via acquisitions. It was around about 60-40 in the last year. Sometimes it goes the other way. Clearly, that is a, a matter for what sort of uh, deals we've been able to see and conclude. Uh, I've already said the, the assets uh, that we take care of are around about 7.8 billion and we did two acquisitions in the last calendar year. Uh, between them they provide perfect examples of the, of the typical things that we want to, to buy. Uh, first and foremost we bought another SIP provider, MC Trustees. This is what we like to call an overlay. This is something that we already do where we were able to very easily bring this <coughs> MC Trustees, a SIP provider, which was able to, to um, be, be added on to what we do, a, a, an overlay to what we do. It was our 19th acquisition. Our 20th, uh, strictly speaking, is, is probably 19 and a half because we bought 49% of a firm that many of you all know, Amati Global Investors, boutique uh, smaller companies and VCT uh, managers based in Edinburgh, which we completed in February. That was a gap fill. I'm Chief Investment Officer, we're building out our asset management skills and we very much recognise that we didn't have that skill set within the business. We recognised and knew the Amati people of old, uh, know them very well, uh, thought they'd be a fantastic fit and fortunately they agreed. If you'll allow me to call that our 20th acquisition, strictly speaking it won't be completed for about 18 months, we've made 20 acquisitions, all 20 have been earnings enhancing, all 20 have been successful. We're sometimes asked, indeed I was asked last week uh, by some of the analysts we were seeing, uh, what about the, the ones that, uh, the deals that you're not doing? Well, we're not doing them because we don't think they'll work. And sometimes we see lots of those, sometimes we have one meeting and know instantly that's not going to work, and sometimes we get to pretty much signing the paper and something changes. So it's not that we are trying to do a certain number or, or get a particular amount during the course of the year, it's trying to do the right deals. Again, Andy referred to this, one of our main aims is to reduce costs for clients and perhaps, it has to be said in context, but we do believe that the financial services business charges too much generally as a total expense ratio. And we believe that the charges that we are making at the moment are, are very realistic, they're, they're very reasonable as you'll hear for our, for our long term targets and sustainability, but we also believe they're too high in the long term and we are reducing those, and at the moment, over the last three years, we've reduced them each year. And that's a very important part of, of what we're trying to deliver. And we've, we've made an adjustment to our management structure, 
which you, you can see if you, if you uh, Google the details, but we've significantly reduced the size of our PLC board uh, in favour of a senior executive team that, that really is running the business. So uh, we, we think we're set up very nicely for the future. In terms of investor highlights, you can, you can see the numbers for yourselves. We have a target of around about 20% profit margin. We think that that is sustainable, deliverable, and we know it's not as high as some of the other listed wealth management businesses. Uh, our sense is that their figures are too high, that we can sustain that number, whatever is thrown at us, uh, we're not sure that some of the higher numbers are entirely sustainable. We've got a progressive dividend policy, and as I said, we have significant cash, uh, what the press like to call a war chest, but if we find the right acquisition, yes, it's helpful for that, uh, but it's also not a bad thing uh, in the current environment. The little chart on the right-hand side, uh, and you, I think, all got a presentation in front of you, just shows how the assets that we look after are broken down. The full circle is the total assets, around about 7.8 billion that we oversee. Uh, then there is the amount that we advise on. Then the next part of the fan is the part that we have discretionary management rights over. And then the top of the fan, the three sections represent, as at the end of May, these figures were all, as at the end of May, I should have said, uh, they represent the amount that we have in our unique structured products fund, which we only launched on the 28th of November last year. Stood at just under 100 million in May, stands at 125 million today. This is unique, this is something we've devised, this is something we've brought to the market, being the product provider because nobody else was doing it and our clients were demanding it. We have a, a REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust, under our brand of Custodia, uh, which I won't say a great deal about. Uh, it is a 400 million pound fund, uh, typically smaller lot sizes, regional properties. And <coughs> at the time, we ran one uh, OIC, one open uh, ended investment uh, company. We've expanded that range since, and there's now more money in that range of investments. I will quickly talk about the products, uh, two of which we brought to market. The, the other one we brought in to our stable. And I'll start in the middle because this is where we find Amati. We brought in Amati Global Investors. Uh, when they joined us, they had £120 million of assets under management. Uh, they are now north of £170 million of assets. They're renowned for their management of the UK Smaller Companies Fund, Paul Jordan and his team, uh, and also two VCTs. They have a, a modest but already award-winning IHT AIM portfolio as well. Based in Edinburgh, uh, the sort of people that we felt were talking our language as soon as we started speaking to them. And the first time we've done one of these deals where it's not all, all in one go, uh, it was important to them to see how things went. They didn't want to give up everything at the point at which they thought they were just beginning to get some traction. But they recognised that we brought something very, very valuable to them, which was a, an extra distribution layer. And I'll talk more about distribution in a moment. The custodian REIT uh, came out of uh, something that we did within the SIPs. We used to run uh, very, very many syndicates uh, for commercial property purchases. Uh, it was getting, frankly, a little administratively heavy, uh, which made it a little more expensive for clients. <coughs> and the more clients had in these sort of things, the more liquidity became an issue. You can imagine, I'm sure, that if uh, an owner-manager buys the factory or office from which they work, they're quite happy to continue owning that, at least until such time as they retire, possibly longer than that. But if they're buying into property as an investment and want to change their mind about something, uh, the liquidity could be quite important. The, the, the REIT has delivered that. Uh, just over three and a half years ago, it had 100 million pounds at launch, and now it's 400 million pounds. And most recently, and uniquely compared to the others, because you can find those things uh, with other good managers elsewhere, we uh, recognise that although our clients love structured product plans, which we've used for a long time, they didn't really like the paperwork. They didn't like the fact that they had to sit in them, and again, they didn't. They were beginning to not quite like the lack of liquidity so much. So we devised a structured product. Plan. We brought this to market on the 28th of November, and as I say, it stands at £125 million pounds today. Uh, the sincerest form of flattery is uh, when people go and copy you. We understand there are two firms trying to launch their own, but as of today, it's unique in the marketplace. I'd like to show this not because it's about the financials, but because it shows the different sources of revenue that we have within the business. So from the left-hand side, 
uh, you've got last year's uh, source of revenue. Then you've got discretionary management. It was revenue generative uh, again this year. Discretionary management doesn't need an explanation to you, I'm sure. Advisor charges are those charges that we make when we're providing advice, when we are setting up plans, when we're uh, providing consultancy. The structure of products fund I've just spoken about. Specifically, pension consultancy and administration fees is still a core part of our business. And we run now just over 10,000 SIPs. And so that's a really interesting and different revenue source. It is almost as uncorrelated as it can be to something like discretionary management fees, which are primarily related to how we're doing with the assets, the extent to which they've grown or, or otherwise. Uh, banking, you probably don't need to be told in the current environment, uh, is not terribly exciting from a revenue perspective. It might get a little bit more exciting over the next year, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Uh, and property management is the custodian capital, which is both the REIT and also something else we provide called our Private Investors Club, uh, which is only available to high net worth and sophisticated investors and typically likes to bring really interesting, modest, typically property-related ideas to clients with an 8% plus return. Employee benefits, I said earlier on, is a modest part of our business and is a very modest uh, generator of the additional revenue in the last year. But it is a really important part of the business and I'll, I'll talk about it more on the next slide. When we're seeing corporate clients and they want to talk to us about the auto-enrolment requirements that they have, the regulatory requirements, the fact that they want risk putting into their business or simply the fact that they want to start looking after their employees, how do we do that, they say to Matty Early Woods. There's a really interesting conversation that then happens, actually I like what you've done, I'm FD, I'm CEO, I'm HR, can you look after my finances? And of course that works the other way around. That big arrow that swoops from the right over to the left hand side shows that 600,000 of revenues came just from uh, uh, recommendations in the last year from our employee benefits team, from our consultants who just deal with the corporate clients through to the wealth management consultants. The employee benefits business provides now a, a full consultancy. Uh, if you've dealt with employee benefits firms in the past, they've tended to be rather more broking orientated. What price can we get this for for you? Does it fit in a box? There it is. Uh, we did that ourselves a few years ago and we've moved uh, over the last two years to, to a full consultancy, what you might call a 21st century way of doing it. Flexible benefits, financial education, all of these sort of things are, are fairly de rigueur. We also find increasingly that we are providing more and more multi-generational cascading of wealth type of advice. And we can more and more readily say that we're now dealing with not just two, but three generations of families. And I think that's really important. There was a survey out in America a couple of years ago that suggested that when a wealth management client died, the wealth management firm only retained around about 25% of the money. In other words, three and four would go to someone else's advisor, typically the widow or the husband would ask around their friends, this has just happened, what should I do? Uh, I can't honestly tell you our figure precisely, it's something we're working on for, for our next set of presentations, but we believe we're something north of 80% in that same example, because of the relationship we have with the clients and the fact that it's so advice led. I've mentioned a couple of times a couple of our goals. We have four absolutely key and critical goals, and um, it's fair to say that our uh, advisors weren't all keen on us putting all of these into the market around about three, four years ago. Andy probably knows better than I do precisely what it was about four years ago. Veteran. Uh, veteran, indeed. Uh, we said, look, we're turning over around about 25 million pounds. We've got around about two and a half, three billion of assets that we advise on. We, we want to tell you what our aims are. We can't give you a date. That, that's completely impractical. But we want to tell you that this is what we're aiming for. Think, plan, execute. This is what we're after. And it is 100 million of revenue, 15 billion of assets, much more of which is discretionary and, <coughs> and direct hours rather than administered. That 20% profit margin. And not forgetting that all of this time, we want to be reducing client costs. There's a little graph on the right hand side, it may be better for you on the uh, presentations in front of you than on the screen, but this is an example of one of the ways that we're doing this, and there are many others. This is a typical balanced medium risk portfolio, what we call our model portfolio of five. And around about three years ago, the uh, ongoing charges figure was around 0.8% the internal costs of, of the funds. 
it's now just slightly south of 0.5. And all of that has just gone back for the benefit of the client without the benefit, uh, without the, 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 the suffering of, of the performance along the way. We are broadening our proposition. I think it's fair to say that when you look at some of our acquisitions over the next two or three years, there'll be more overlay and there'll be more gap fill, depending on what you think the gaps are. The integration of acquisitions is a really important part of what we do. Uh, we looked at a firm a couple of years ago who had, I'll be careful what I say, a number of different locations around the UK, many of which didn't chime with ours. We thought, fantastic, that would work really well. Every single one of them had been a purchase, and every single one of them was still an individual entity. There had been no integration whatsoever. We were going to have to integrate. It was around about 14 locations. That, that didn't feel like a good idea, and that didn't take a long conversation to have. Those things, we believe, are really important. And you may have a question about robo-advice, which I'm happy to answer, but I'll tell you now, we don't see it as a, as a threat, as a competitor. We see it as a disruptor in the market. And we know that our clients are not so interested in what I call digital advice. They're much more interested in digital access. And so that's what we're concentrating on providing. I've talked a bit about organic growth. It is really essential. It's provided by us putting a lot of time, effort, blood, sweat, and tears into our consultancy team, plain and simple. You can see that's grown over the course of the last year. Two very photogenic examples here. They were hardly going to use a photo of me with my face for radio. But we brought on 1,200 new clients across a range of different areas, corporate clients, pure wealth management clients, SIP clients. That is really, really important. If we just went out and bought businesses to, to grow the numbers, I'm not sure we'd be half the business that we are. I said I'd talk about hats. I spoke to a client last week who is setting up a hat shop. We are very happy to <coughs> assist that client, provide consultancy, but they're not wealthy. They haven't got a huge amount of uh, funds in bank accounts and, and heaven knows what. They've barely got ISAs and, and a bit of pension. But what they want is someone to hold their hand on the corporate side of things, and our employee benefits team can do that. As and when this really takes off, we know that that is a ready-made wealth management client for our business. I said I'd talk about horses in a similar way. Our clients like to spend their time, they often tell us their time poor, doing what they love doing. I'm from the new market area. Many of them, frankly, uh, would like to spend more time with their horses than they would on their finance. <coughs> that makes us an ideal place for them. They don't want to be sat deep into the night trying to work which button to push on the computer to buy the share that they've just read about. Some do, but many don't. We know that alternative investments are important and hence why we've gone down that route. And, and owning our distribution is really vital. Uh, we don't, we, we're not the third party in a relationship. The client comes straight to us. <coughs> uh, we're, we're sackable by the client, not by some a uh, middleman who's saying, oh, I've changed my mind about who you should have your sit with. That's really valuable to us. We want to develop our brand. I've spoken about apprenticeships. I've spoken about the, uh, the, the graduate program that we have for consultants. We put a lot into mentoring, and we, we take on what we call life-served people as well. We love bringing in people from other professions, other, other areas. We bring different disciplines. I've got an army guy sits 12 feet from me at the moment. We've got a few edges to knock off, but he, he's brilliant. And he's starting from scratch learning about the financial services business, and he's going to be a huge asset to the business. I've mentioned uh, Amati very briefly, a couple of things to, to, to add to here. The majority of that change from 120 million to 178 million is not just Mattioli Wood's funds. It's actually come from external investors, seeing what we've done, reading that we've bought 49% of the business, and for whatever reason, we clearly can't be sure, deciding that now's the time to put more money into a market. It's not because their performance has suddenly uh, become fantastic. It's been fantastic for a long time. They've been winning awards for a long time. We take that as, as a bonus, as a sign that people are happy that a firm like Mattioli Woods has, A, brought a Marty on site, and the Marty's got the backing of a firm like Mattioli Woods. So, my final slide, we are a business that is listed, and therefore, in no particular order, our stakeholders include shareholders, progressive dividend policy, target of 20% profit growth year on year, those targets I spoke about before for revenues, for, for funds, they're all important elements. We do want to continue to innovate. Sometimes we develop something that someone else is doing, we just do a different version of it. And sometimes, like the Structured Products Fund, we bring in something that is completely new from the outset. 
We do believe in maintaining what we have, growing. Uh, we, we believe in providing service to those people we already deal with, but we do love dealing with those people tomorrow that we don't know today. We think there will be a lot of consolidation across many of our markets. It's already happening. Uh, and purely for the analysts in the room, we're currently trading in line with expectations. I know Andy likes that line. I do believe that wealth management is a very, very competitive environment. It's not going to be any less so. I think the robo-advice and other disruptors that may yet be coming to the market will help to drive down costs, but we do not see them as a competitor of ours. We simply think they will be a catalyst, perhaps alongside the regulator for those things happening, and so we are determined to make sure we do that at our pace, at our rate, and before anybody comes along and taps us on the shoulder and says you've got to do it. We think that's a much healthier way of working. Uh, and I'm in danger of running over, so...